My name is Gary Young. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Manchester, uh, a journalist and an author. And when I was asked to do this event, I said yes immediately uh, because I have so many personal ties to this story. My mother came from Barbados in 62 and was a nurse. Uh, both of my aunts who came to Britain were nurses. Uh, my niece uh, and goddaughter who's in the room, but I won't point her out because she'll be embarrassed. <laughs> it's just qualified as a midwife. Yeah, now you're looking. <laughs> and these two um, phenomenon, the Windrush phenomenon and the NHS, both celebrating 75 years, but there is more than just a date that they share, that the NHS is the best example of the migration and the immigrants that Britain needs, that Britain could not survive without immigration. And the NHS is more popular than the monarchy. It's the most popular thing that we have. And yet, it could not survive without migration. Uh, and somehow that is not fully understood. And I think that actually philosophically even, the, the fact of that tells a story because it means that people come from all over the world and they can come from all over the world and they can work for the NHS because the NHS is about health and that's about the human body. And the human body is the same. It doesn't matter what country you are from. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter who you worship or what you worship or whether you worship anything at all. And so that enables large numbers of people. It's not like law or teaching or the human body is the same all over the world. But there is one other thing that they share in this moment, which is that they have both been, both Windrush and the NHS have almost been elevated beyond reason. And when I say that, what I mean is that they are both kind of held up as these kind of ceremonially wonderfully wonderful things that represent something that Britain does not want to support, that Britain won't vote for, that, uh, uh, that somehow these have become things that we celebrate, but are, f are finding it very difficult to sustain that we will venerate but will not support and uh with that i want to um cede the mic to professor stephanie snow and her uh, slides on uh, history of migration in the nhs Professor Snow is a historian of medicine and healthcare at the University of Manchester. We really should meet more often. Her core interest lies in analyzing and understanding the relations between the knowledge, practice, and performance of medicine and healthcare across periods, contexts, cultures, and geographies. Her publications range from the introduction of anesthesia in the 19th century to the experiences of black minority and ethnic clinicians in the NHS and the global history of strokes since the 1950s. And with that, I welcome Dr. Stephanie Snow. Thank you, Gary. I mean, I think that was just a perfect context setting for tonight. Um, it's such a great pleasure to be here with you. I feel this is a really sort of key event in all the anniversary celebrations that are going on around NHS 75. <clears throat> so my interest in this area began when I worked on the history of ethnically diverse people in the NHS in the late 2000s. And at that point, I was commissioned by Manchester Primary Care Trust um, to research the history and present it to them in a digestible form, <clears throat> excuse me, that would give them some basis on which to think about policy and practice around equality and diversity. So right from the beginning, it was a very sort of, you know, relevant sort of history that I was asked to do. 
So with my colleague, Emma Jones, we worked, we've used oral history as our method. We interviewed doctors, nurses, and other health professionals who'd been working in Manchester since 1948. And looking back now, it was such an important project because it made me think much more deeply about the NHS and about the people that together make it what it is and the way in which migration has been a key part of that history right from the very sort of beginning. And this made me much more passionate about capturing the voices of people who were not on the historical record, including ethnically diverse communities, including communities with either chronic health conditions or mental health um, problems that nobody had ever sort of talked to or sat down with before. So the historical record of the NHS, when I started to sort of do this work, which was sort of back in the um, 2010s, you know, we had clinicians on record, we had politicians, civil servants, but they were my, mainly white men. There were very few voices that spoke to different roles in the NHS, different generations coming from different places. So in 2017, I was very fortunate, we got funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, set up a project called NHS at 70 and began working up to the 70th anniversary trying to capture these, these voices, particularly the generations who were in their 80s and 90s and who could remember what the UK was like before the NHS, the early generations who came from other places to work in it. So by March 2020, we had about 800 interviews. We were planning an exhibition. You all know what happened then. So the NHS became center stage for the UK's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we refocused our work to start collecting COVID focused interviews, so experiences of people working on the front line, patient shielding at home, particularly focusing on as many diverse sort of communities as possible. And we were very lucky to get more funding to do that, and the complete collection is now deposited at the British Library under the um, name Voices of our National Health Service. We've also published a book, including some of the stories to mark the NHS 75th anniversary. And Dennis Singson, who's one of our panel members tonight, you know, his story features in, in that book. It's an important story. So, you know, let's look back to 1948 and see where it all started. So the NHS was established by the post-war Labour government, in which Inurin Bevan was the health minister. Through the Second World War, there'd been a growing political consensus that there was a need for some sort of comprehensive health service across the country. There were blatant inequalities in access and also variation in health care. Both the Labour and Conservative manifestos included a commitment to establishing a health service. But it was Bevan's vision of what that health service should look like that produced the NHS of 1948. Britain would still have had some sort of health service if the Conservatives had won, if another health minister had been appointed. But it would have looked and felt quite different. Because the important thing about Bevan is that he had grown up in a poor mining community in Tredegra in the South Wales Valleys. His lived experiences were at the root of his vision of a health service that would make treatment and care available to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. And that's why he argued and fought so strongly that the health service should be funded, not through an insurance scheme, but paid for out of national taxation, because that way everybody could have access to it without having to pay directly at the point of need. It's also important to note that the health service wasn't created from scratch. Bevan simply had to take the services that were in place, the networks, the hospitals that were existed at that point of time and bring it together as the National Health Service. And so many of the issues that the NHS continues to grapple with today have their origins in the way in which it was first sort of created. At the time, you know, the NHS was criticized um, especially from places like the United States, because there was a real um, concern that the state was committing itself to an expenditure that it would not be able to sustain. 
Nevertheless, by the 1950s, the NHS was established as part of UK identity. It was recognised on the international stage as a symbol of British social and political values. And now, of course, you know, as Gary said, it's hardly an exaggeration to call it a cultural icon. But one of the problems that the NHS faced right from the beginning was workforce shortages. And since at least the 1930s, there had been shortages, particularly of nurses and auxiliary staff. And UK health services had had to recruit from places like Ireland, from places like Europe. But after the war, the post-war labour shortage made this much more difficult. And the previous free-flowing recruitment processes, particularly between the UK and Ireland, um, significantly reduced the number of Irish nurses coming to the UK. So when the NHS began on the 5th of July 1948, there were 54,000 nursing vacancies across the country. And not only were there vacancies, but there were plans. NHS services had to be expanded to meet the new aim of providing equal health services across the country. So the NHS was established at a time when the British Empire was breaking up. So the government's plan was to look at colonies and former colonies and seek to enlist staff from those places, particularly focusing on Caribbean and South Asian subcontinents. The 1948 Nationality Act meant that all people from former colonies were granted full citizenship. So there was no question at that time as to whether or not those people had the right to come and work and live in the UK. So from 1949, there are reports from the Ministries of Health and Labour, together with the Colonial Office of General Nursing Council and the Royal College of Nursing, travelling out to the Caribbean to recruit hospital auxiliary staff, nurses and trainee nurses. The local papers were sources of advertisement, so things like the Barbados Beacon um, would have advertisements from different hospitals. And one that we found, it specified that applicants should be between 18 and 30, literate and willing to commit to a three-year contract. By 1955, there were official nursing recruitment campaigns across 16 different British colonies and former colonies. And as I said, alongside these official recruitment programmes, individual hospitals were advertising locally for staff. Yvonne Cog... No, it hasn't played yet. Sorry, I'm just balancing the, the audio. So Yvonne Coghill was born in Guyana in South America, and she came as a small child to the UK in the 1950s with her mother, who became a nurse in the NHS. And Yvonne talks here about why people wanted to come at that time. Um, at that time in the 50s, it was um, really a very exciting time, I think, for lots of people in the Caribbean because Britain had just come out of the war and there was a lot of uh, encouragement, advertise, uh, adver advertisements and so on to ask people to, to come to England to work in their hospitals, mail um, and the railway. And lots of people took that opportunity, bought their tickets, got on the boats and came across to the mother country in the hope um, that, you know, it was the land of milk and honey. And recruitment continued right through. So in 1970, Carol Baxter had grown up in Jamaica. She'd studied science at the University of Jamaica. She responded to an advert in the local Jamaican paper, The Gleaner, and arrived in Manchester on New Year's Eve, 1970. But despite being delighted to be in this sort of strange country with the cold weather and the very odd food, um, she found the day-to-day -day experiences of nurse training to be shaped by racism and discrimination. And the quote on the slide recounts the reception that she was given by some patients. But it wasn't just in terms of patient reception that there were difficulties. There was clear um, discrimination when it, comes to, when it came to um, the actual training that she was able to access. So, for example, white girls were given obstetric specialist plates placements. Black girls were given geriatrics. At this point, the Race Relations Act had come into force in 1950, 1965. 
and that did ban racial discrimination in public places, but it didn't cover employment organisations like the NHS. So for people like Carol, there was no recourse to legislation um, or regulations, nor at this point was there any public discussion of the relationship between racism and the low status and marginality of ethnically diverse, as in, diverse nurses in the NHS. And one of the um, worst examples of the way in which this sort of affected people's chances of progression and training was that the majority of women who came to the UK were automatically allocated to training as a state enrolled nurse, which at that point it was not an internationally recognised qualification. So those people who had come with the expectation that they would do their three years, they'd get a qualification, they'd be able to either go back home or work in a different place, found themselves actually doing something that wasn't going to be any help for them going forwards. They also then um, struggled to um, get promoted because they were on the lower sort of ranks of the internal nursing hierarchies. So that limited their options all round. And the impact of this segregation created by this two tier system of nurse qualification affected the career trajectories of many migrant nurses, because it all SNE all SEN nurses tend to be channeled towards the less popular specialties than the SRN nurses. The clipping on the um, slide is from a Nursing Times report in 1986, when at least by the 80s this issue was starting to be um, discussed and at that point when they were considering restructuring nurse training you'll see that they were sort of hugely concerned about what would happen um, to nursing workloads if SENs were no longer within the system. So this is just like a very brief sort of overview of the sort of key points of the, the way in which lives and careers were affected by this. And I think the important thing to point about nurses is that they had additional challenges because of the intersections of gender alongside sort of race. Um, and I know that there isn't much time to go into this, but it wasn't just the um, racism and discrimination, but also it was the way in which these issues interwove with the cultures of medicine and nursing and all the hierarchies that were already sort of present in those systems. So one of our most important findings, I think, from that sort of early study that we did in Manchester, which I had not been aware of before, was that when you looked at sort of the different government policy streams bridging this area, so health workforce planning, immigration policies, um, race relations, you know, one would imagine that there would be some connection between these because there has been this very clear direct relationship between them since 1948. But the policy streams have never been integrated. They have always been treated separately. And this has meant that over the period, as the NHS has successively looked to recruit from other places for people to come and work in the NHS, immigration policy has been tightened again and again and again. And at various points in this in its history, you know, it's made it incredibly difficult for people to come and work, despite the fact that the NHS was absolutely reliant on them. And at various points, you know, the health service could not have survived without people coming from other places to support it. In terms of race relations, you know, there's a clear policy um, stream from the 1960s. But again, extraordinarily, it's only in 2000 that this becomes applied to NHS organisations, to public bodies, which obviously includes the NHS. And so, you know, before 2000, there was no onus on any health organisation to collect statistics um, around sort of career progression or promotion opportunities that would highlight any disparity or divergence between different races and different genders. From the 1980s, um, migrant staff themselves start to mobilize against racism. So the Overseas Doctors Association, for example, was established in 1975. 
and that became prominent in promoting issues around fairness and equality and it was disputing claims that overseas doctors were poorly qualified that their qualifications were not comparable to those in the uk and it was swiftly recognized by the uk government which enabled it to begin a dialogue with bodies like the department of health the royal colleges and the general medical council to start to build an understanding of the impact that discrimination was having on the lives and careers of people who'd come from different places. But nursing struggled more to obtain this sort of public advocacy. And in 1988, the, it was the first time when racism was, racism was introduced as an issue in terms of affecting recruitment and retention of nurses through Carol Baxter's work. And again, she exemplifies so many people um, who have the background of migration in that they challenge the system, they push, they really sort of work hard to make sure that future generations have a better experience than they did. Nevertheless, you know, there's still little change. Um, you know, before the um, Race Relations Act was extended to public bodies, the Department of Health commissioned a survey in 2000 that found that half of frontline NHS staff from ethnically diverse backgrounds had suffered racial harassment in the previous 12 months. I mean, in 2000, that was just appalling. The lack of action was partly driven um, because the NHS was not subject to the Race Relations Act. And then once monitoring began, actually the issues became really clear and they really began to um, move up the sort of agenda for people to take action um, and again i'm going back to yvonne coghill here she was one of the people that we interviewed um, for our nhs at 70 project and interestingly she said you know she'd followed her mother into nursing in the 1970s she did not believe she'd experienced any problem with racism or discrimination through her career development until she tried to get a post as director of nursing and at that point she got fed up with so many rejections she was about to leave the nhs but happened to meet the nhs then chief executive nigel crisp who was launching the leadership race equality action plan in the early 2000s. So she became his mentee and worked as his private secretary and rapidly became even more aware of the issues around race in terms of senior leadership. But I was his, his private secretary for health, so I would look at all the, the, the letters and the invitations and all the rest of it that were coming in. And I got to see documents and all sorts of things that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to see. So I could see very clearly there was an issue with race. I could see it. It was, it, was, it, was, it was in my face that there were only 12 at that time executive directors of nursing from a black and minority ethnic background, yet we had thousands uh, at that time, you know, probably about 18 or 19 percent, uh, if yeah, around about that of, of, of people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds that were nurses. So I don't know, 12? It's really strange. So the, the wheels started to ro rotate in my head about something's going on here this is not this is not right because i knew hundreds of black and ethnic minority nurses you know just working in brent and harrow and hillingdon there was just so many of us around so the fact that there were only 12 executive directors of nursing nurses that could actually sit around the board table and make decisions and five chief executives from black and ethnic minority backgrounds i started to think something's not right here so thanks to the work of people like Yvonne and many others, by the sort of 2010s, you know, nurses on the ground are starting to report that things have improved somewhat. Um, this is Yasma Osman and she talks about how cultural awareness particularly seems to have been improved from earlier periods. Whoops. Don't know how to, oh, can't get the audio. I'll tell you what she says. Yeah, see if you can click, see if that works. Absolutely tons better. I mean, when I started nursing, Muslims and Jews were all put together, um, you know. I mean, there wasn't even halal food available then, halal meat. We used to go eat the Jewish, the kosher meat. So all the meals in Cheatham Hill when I was training were, is, were kosher. So if we had an actual Muslim, i.e. as in myself or a patient, 
because uh, then it would be kosher. Oh, yeah, Muslim, right, kosher. Actually, kosher is for Jews. Halal is for Muslims. So where are we now? I mean, I think in terms of public understanding and appreciation of the intertwined history of migration and the NHS, I think things have become a lot more open um, since 2018. I mean, I think the NHS itself did a huge job in 2018 of putting the NHS and Windrush on the map and making it so visible in the terms of awards ceremonies and really recognising the sort of contributions. I mean, having a migration museum now is really important across our national culture for having a space for having these sort of conversations, these issues there in public life. So I think, you know, when you look at the recent coronation of the king, for example, you know, Dame Elizabeth Annie Onwu, um, who is of um, African heritage, you know, was invited to be part of the ceremony along with that. I mean, I can't see that of happening, you know, back in the sort of two as in the 2000s. I just don't think um, the visibility was there. So I think at different levels, you know, you can sort of say, OK, yes, things actually look different. But alongside the positive and hopeful aspects and i think it really links to what gary's saying about you know celebrating and venerating something is not the same as supporting and sustaining it so we know for example with the 2018 celebrations around windrush the government scandal about not maintaining records of people who came at that early period and trying to wrongly deport them and at the very least cause them dreadful harassment was going on and I mean, most recently, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on ethnically diverse staff and patients in the NHS, that's not a surprise to those of us who know this history, but nonetheless, it's shocking in its starkness. So I think the only way to move forward is to be having conversations at public level that to, you know, can be moved into policy making to make this an issue for us all because it matters, you know, this history matters, not just to people who have come from different places, but to anybody in the UK today and for future generations, you know, the NHS is what it is and it has the potential and capacity it has because of the people who came from elsewhere and we need to recognize this and so tonight i hope will be a drop in the ocean thank you um and i want to call liberty for the migration museum <clears throat> to introduce uh, the video that the Migration Museum has uh, put on. So thank you all very much for having um, me here tonight and the Migration Museum. Um, it is such a pleasure uh, to be putting our exhibition um, uh, out there, which is Heart of the Nation, Migration and the Making of the NHS. Um, but to be shining a spotlight on these thousands, hundreds of thousands of stories that are just so incredibly important and so vital to not just the NHS, but to the whole of Britain. Um, so for those of you who might not have heard of the Migration Museum, we are a team um, who are working towards creating Britain's first national museum to explore the story of migration over thousands of years, both people coming and going uh, from Britain and the impact that they've had on all of our lives. Um, it is an incredibly important story and one that so often gets ignored uh, for divisive politics, for scapegoating, for uh, kind of divisive rhetoric. Um, and yet, um, actually, we know that migration is a topic that can bring us together. It can be something that we share in and it can be something that we are proud to celebrate. Um, so we have been working for the last 10 years to create uh, the Migration Museum. We're currently based down in Lewisham. Absolutely encourage all of you to come and visit us. We're based in a shopping centre in a former H&M unit uh, there until the end of the year. And then for the next three years, we'll be moving to a slightly different unit within the shopping centre. We are, and we have this year, just been announced that our permanent home will be, um, uh, will be being built for us over the next few years. So Britain will finally have a migration museum to put these stories right where they deserve to be, which is 
absolutely in the spotlight. Um, but I'm here to talk to you today about the Heart of the Nation exhibition. Um, we have always, as a team, wanted to do an exhibition to mark this anniversary, the 75 years of the NHS, because we knew that the NHS just simply would not be what it was is today. It would never have been created. It would not never have thrived, and and it would not um, it would not be what we all hold it to be, which is yeah, su such an incredibly important institution, the most popular uh, kind of part of of Britain. Um, and we we've always wanted to put that that uh, that story kind of absolutely front and center. However, in 2020, actually, our plans got brought forward a little bit further. The pandemic happened, and all of a sudden, the people who have always sacrificed, who've always gone above and beyond to put themselves and their needs uh, kind of behind those of their patients, those are the people that they work so tirelessly and so endlessly to to help. Um, they, they, those stories we wanted to make sure were kind of being told. So in 2020, we actually created a digital version of Heart of the Nation, Migration and the Making of the NHS, um, which you can all explore online. Um, we this year have actually turned it into a physical exhibition, which we launched just last week in Leicester. So after you visit us down in Lewisham, we'll all get the train up to Leicester together. We'll go and see that exhibition. It's on until the end of October. We then hope to take it on the road to Leeds and bring it back down uh, to London. We want to shout about these incredible stories from the rooftops at all corners of the UK um, to make sure that, yeah, these stories are being championed and being recognised because um, it's only with people recognising them that we can yeah, A, say our thanks, which I think is uh, just so incredibly important. Um, but we can also talk about the issues that the NHS is facing today, the people who are still fighting for, for it to, to thrive and to survive. Um, so this is an animation that was created for the launch of the online exhibition. Um, it was created in 2020. Um, you'll notice that we have Michael Rosen speaking uh, and narrating the video. Of course, for him, it was an incredibly personal story because he spent months in the ICU uh, recovering from COVID um, and he very much gave his thanks uh, to, yeah, to all of the incredible people that helped him survive and helped him still be here today. So I'm going to hand over and let the video do its speaking, but thank you so much for, for having us here today. It's such an absolute pleasure. Thanks. They know us. They take care of us. Often they are the first and the last people we see. Sometimes they know us more intimately than we know ourselves. And yet often we know very little about them. Who is the doctor behind the face mask? Who's the person behind the uniform? Right from the beginning, people have come from all over the world to work in the NHS. They've made its vision come true. Many were here already. They came from Ireland and from Central Europe. Some were refugees from Nazism, leaving everything they had behind them. Many more were recruited from Britain's former colonies. Nurses from the Caribbean, doctors from the Indian subcontinent and Africa. When there were staff shortages again and again, international workers answered the call. Some escaped war zones. Some came in search of love some for adventure or opportunity. They overcame great barriers. Many were told they weren't good enough. They should wait for their time or go back to where they came from. Some were sent to areas that British-born doctors and nurses didn't want to go, to do jobs that others didn't want to do. Yet they persisted as surgeons, nurses, family GPs, Carers, cleaners, porters, caterers, researchers, caring for others, saving lives, and creating a life for themselves in Britain, falling in love, getting involved in their communities, having children, creating new generations following in their parents' footsteps, working on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic alongside colleagues from around the world. This is the story of the NHS. This is our story.
so now we're going to have. First of all, thank you for that. That was that was beautiful. And thank you, uh, Professor Snow. That was uh, that was wonderful. And we're really set up now um, to hear from our speakers. And we're going to start with um, Alison Alison Williams, MBE, who came to England in May 1969 from Trinidad to train as a nurse at the Whittington Hospital in Highgate. Um, Alison was featured in an R RCN um, uh, article recently, and she said at a certain point, having faced racism from the patients, she said she had an aha moment on her ward that she stood up at the front. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> And I will let her take it from there. Well, he was about to steal part of my thunder. <laughs> Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, as you've heard, you might have recognized me in some of those young pictures. Um, I am Alison Williams. And I came in May 1969 to train as a nurse. Um, and I was 21, so you do the math. <laughs> um, it was, my journey was quite interesting because, um, sorry? Okay. My journey was quite interesting because um, it took me a while. As I said, I was 21. So it took me a while to decide that I actually wanted to train as a nurse, but it was something that I had said all my life because my mother was a nurse. And I always thought I wanted to be so much like her because I really enjoyed the passion and the energy she, she had when she talked about her career. And as I grew older, when I was a teenager, I would beg her to take me to some of her private patients that she would deliver um, in their homes and I just thought it was such a wonderful career to have and I just want thought I wanted to feel the way she felt about her work I wanted to feel the same way too so all her friends were nurses says well said um, you have to go to the Ministry of Health in Trinidad because the British government um, they're coming and inviting people to come to train and England is the best place to train and the qualification is recognized everywhere in the world and you will have better job opportunities, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I mean, there was never a question. It was only when I actually got to England and I found out that some of my friends had this problem with the SRN, SEN scenario. They, because, I mean, I had O levels and A levels, so I suppose to them there was never a question that I would do anything else but be an SRN. But I did get interviewed, selected, and all my arrangements made through the Ministry of Health, um, following them also telling me that, you know, Britain was inviting people to train as nurses. So I came, and um, the reality of it, I was really excited because, of course, in, in the Caribbean, all your secondary school training and, you know, work that you do was based on the English system because we were British and then, you know, we became part of the Commonwealth. So I assumed everybody was as equally bright, as equally interested in having us there. I felt that we would be really welcomed um, and, you know, they couldn't wait. I was really, really excited, you know, but the reality of it was so different. Um, well, the, the first thing, I mean, I know it was it was likely that Britain would not be as developed as um, we had learned about, but um, that was also quite a bit of a culture shock. I'd never seen so much dereliction and grayness and unhappy people, you know, before, in, well, I suppose before, I'd never been anywhere else. Um, and so it was quite different, you know, because there was no color, there was no energy in the place. But we started training and one of the recommendations from the ministry was that I should go to the Whittington Hospital and I did choose it because they said the Whittington Hospital was um, quite a friendly place and a lot of the staff were from the Caribbean and that was quite true. I made some very good friends which I have up to today um, and we all went along working hard together but the patients and some of the staff were extremely racist 
very rude and it was very disruptive and scary because I'd never had that experience and you know although at 21 you assume they're, you're quite grown up you felt very lost and I was very very you know unhappy rang my mother and my complaints fell on deaf ears and she said you know you have a purpose and you have a plan and you have a dream just make sure that it happens she said the, these people are ignorant the racism is their problem not yours and um, find a way to deal with it she didn't actually tell me what to do and i hung up the phone saying but she didn't tell me what to do she just said find a way and as gary alluded to i did i suddenly thought what can i do that would stop this because I felt I wasn't achieving anything. I wasn't learning. I wasn't giving any kind of help or joy to the patients that I was actually um, caring for. And and the the comments were so derogatory. And I kept saying, well, where did these people go to school? Because they asked us, they asked me about, you know, the trees I lived in and how high and what kind of um, branches do we look for to choose to build our homes and do we go to the bathroom in the bushes and do we ride donkeys or buy have we, you know, graduated to bicycles. And I mean, this was 1969. It was a long time ago, but it was just so shocking, you know, and one of my friends who actually went to train in Nottingham was relating to me that she had the same experience and she said what she did was um, she took her photo album that she had put together to remind her of home she took it on the ward to show them and they were quite shocked you know that they were, we were so civilized out in the caribbean and so eventually i did that after my aha moment <laughs> as gary alluded to and i i kept thinking what can i say that would make a difference that would stop these people from affecting my life so much and what it was i just stood up um, in the ward one day and i stopped everything and i stopped everybody and i said listen i am 21 years old i am 21 years black i was born black i know that i'm black and i'm very happy to be black so tell me something i don't know tell me something new and you could hear a pin drop <laughs> because you know this docile little nurse who tried to be nice to them they didn't expect that sort of thing but the, the most impactful thing about saying that was that it's not that the racism stopped but it stopped affecting me it stopped having this negative effect on me and i would just wave them away and said yeah that's all right you know never mind you carry on saying what you want to say it never had that derogatory effect on my career and so I carried on um, doing all the good things that I could find to do. I carried on with my studies and I did my nursing and then my midwifery and progressed through the profession and had an absolutely wonderful time. And, you know, the racism continued when I became the first time I got a job as a manager, a doctor that I knew who was a GP. You know, he came straight up to my face and said, my God, I ne you never told me you had blue eyes. And I said, why? He said, because how did you manage to get that job? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're black. How did you manage to get a management job? He said, you must be really good. I said, well, why didn't you say that in the first place? That I must be really good. You know, and these sorts of things carry. And then, of course, he said, oh, you know, you know me well. I was only joking. And that is what the people did all the time, tell you that they were joking. It was just banter. and. But it was it was very painful, very hard, and it continued all through my career, and um, and so it, it. I mean, my work was there, and I did very well in my career, and even so that my peers recommended me for an MBE, which I received most gratefully about twenty two years ago. I got one, and so I felt somehow at that time I felt vindicated. I didn't know anything about this, and I didn't know what it was because I was more, I was just con, you know concentrating and everybody kept trying to push me forward I wanted to be at the bedside at, you know with the women and their families and their children that I delivered at that stage um, and so that was quite a good vindication to me that I did do my work well that I was recognized by my peers and I'm very grateful for that I'm also very grateful for the other 
wind rush generation people like myself who tolerated because i heard a lot of horrendous stories along the way tolerated the abuse but still put their very best foot forward and did the best they could which was often really excellent for the nhs so thanks for listening Um, thank you, Alison. Um, next, I want to call Dion, Dion Daniel, Associate Director of Nursing at Epsom and St. Helier Hospitals, who came from Trinidad to working in NHS in 1998. That's all I'm going to say, <laughs> just in case. I'm not precious like that. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dion Daniel, and uh, I will correct you. I'm a director of nursing now since December 2022. So I'm going to take that. Um, so you're probably thinking another Trinidadian. Yeah, you get two of us for the price of one. My name is Dion Daniel, and my, my story is mainly based on my aunt. I can't talk about me without talking about my aunt Yvonne Daniel. My aunt Yvonne came and I try to hold it together. <laughs> my auntie Yvonne came here in 1961. And when she was unpacking her bag, she started in Basingstoke. I don't know why, but that's where she started. Someone was asking her about her grass skirt. So they were like, where's it then? Where is it? And she was like, where's what? Where's your grass skirt? And she was a bit surprised. She came here as a registered nurse. She was a midwife as well, but didn't have the opportunity to practice. And she's been my inspiration through it all. Uh, my history in the NHS hasn't been easy, but every time I think about giving up, I remember my auntie and everything she's endured. I came in 1998. I left Trinidad in November. It was like a 30 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and I decided I wanted to come to Eastbourne because contrary to popular opinion, not everyone in the Caribbean lives next to the sea. Okay, myth number one busted. <laughs> I wanted to go to Eastbourne because I didn't want to be in a city and I wanted to live close to the seaside. So I arrived in Eastbourne in 1998. Eastbourne 1998 is nothing like Eastbourne now, okay? The struggle is still real. And of course I had really long braids, you know, like down my back. So people stared at me wherever I went. Um, came to, be, to open a new ward. And, and the, the backstory on this is that I wasn't coming to England. This is what happens when you're curious. I came with a friend who was interested in coming to England. Um, 25 years later, I'm here. The friend never came to England. That's the story. So be, be mindful of curiosity. It sometimes gets you into trouble. Went to Eastbourne and it, to start a new ward. And it was different because even though I came with experience and um, qualifications and had was running a ward in Trinidad, I had a newly qualified nurse to mentor me who had no idea what she was doing. <laughs> Bless her, I love her to bits. I'm godmother to one of her children, but she had no idea. And it was really difficult. I had to really battle to get things done. So within two years, I came in the old days, and this is, um, this is going to show your age. I, was a, I came as a top D grade nurse in the days before we had numbers. So I moved up quickly to an A grade and there was an interview for an F grade, which is what we call sister or charge nurse for those of you um, who, don't, who can't remember that system before 2004. And 20 minutes before my interview, I got called by HR to say, please don't come for the interview. Um, you've not been in the NHS for two years. So even if you were successful, you couldn't, you know, we couldn't interview, you couldn't get a job. No. I've got what we call Carib or first people ancestors from the Caribbean, and we don't give up. And I think sometimes I get into trouble because I can be fueled by determination and stubbornness. So I said, I've got an interview in 20 minutes and I will be there. Went to the interview and did really well. And this is the beauty of telling a story and having people who will fight for you. The panel, all of them went to the chief nurse to say that this isn't right. This is the person who interviewed the best, and this is the person who should have that job. And so in that trust, this, it changed from being that you needed to have two years NHS experience to relevant experience. 
and that's the story. So here and Stephanie speak about the fact that there were 55,000 vacancies in 1948. I laugh. I laugh whenever the argument starts about having to depend on foreign nurses. It's like the NHS was founded on migration. And until a miracle happens, it's probably going to carry on. So we don't need to talk about growing our own, etc. but we need to keep it real. This is the reality. And for me, we had our little community in Eastbourne. We had a little Fili our Filipino crew. We had still had Irish nurses. We had Australians, people from New Zealand, our nurses from India. And I introduced nurses, International Nurses Day in Eastbourne District General Hospital back in the days. And I was really happy and really proud until I decided to go beyond the what became now a band seven rule. It was a struggle. I had to come to London and I had to work in older people's nursing. But enough about me. I guess the, the key thing for me, it, it's that what I'm really proud of now, before I used to really get frustrated by some of the behaviors and traits, but I'm a Daniel. And when we face dilemmas and when we face walls, we break them down. So for me, I use my energy and my anger <laughs> to get involved with the BME network, to make sure that I mentored people who looked like me and who didn't look like me. Because I think it's really important that people understand what it is to be managed or to be mentored by someone who doesn't look like them. And when we have those conversations, things change. And also I'm from the West Indies with a Venezuelan grandmother. So food, I, I didn't cook it, I just arranged it. You, you'd be amazed at what happens when people share food and share stories. So what happened for Nurses Day is that I got people from the Philippines, from India and other countries to talk about what nurse training was like and what their skills were. And suddenly there was that realization that actually these were really skilled people coming to work in the NHS and we weren't recognizing what they bought. I mean, I can tell you, if you cannot get a cannula in in a hospital, you want a nurse from the Philippines or from India. With the eyes closed, that's going to happen. Yes? So you, we, we, we make assumptions about people and we don't know what people are bringing to the place. So for me, the thing that I try to keep it real with is I try to be authentic. And it's difficult being authentic in the NHS sometimes. And I've, 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 I've done it. So my hair is gray, naturally, because when you're in your 50s, you have gray hair. Just saying, no one don't find anyone. And the reason for me is important to be authentic because when people sent for those of us who came here, they knew we had our qualities. They knew we had our qualification. They knew we had our skills. So you also need to deal with my whole authentic self. And I love nursing history, so it was an honor to hear what you do. I'm a member of the History of Nursing Forum. And one of the things I'm making sure happens is that the story of nurses who migrated to the NHS and the stories of nurses who we don't hear about, Filipino nurses, nurses from India, that that story will be told. Because in 25 years in the future, when we celebrate the NHS 100th anniversary, we must talk about the others who remain silent for too long. But I will shut up now. Thank you so much. So, two Trinidadians, <laughs> one stubborn, one very feisty, both very feisty, probably both very stubborn as well. Uh, and now, um, uh, from uh, the Philippines, Dennis Singson, uh, an advanced mental health nurse practitioner in Eastbourne also, um, who's worked in the NHS since... 1999. Dennis, please. Thank you, Gary. So, yeah, so I think just to provide the um, variety, so obviously I'm not from Trinidad. <laughs> and um, just like what Gary said, I am originally from the Philippines. I arrived in the country. My UK journey started in 1999 um which is uh which was 10 years after i qualified um in the philippines um so did my bscn 
in the Philippines, did my master's, arrived in the country October 4th of October 1999 to work in Hastings, which is in East Sussex. Arrived at Heathrow at four in the morning on a gray, cold, wet Saturday morning. Um, excited. I've worked abroad prior, so but still first time um, to go in the um, to go to London. Not even realizing then that I would be living an hour and a half, two hours away from London. So it's not really London, is it? Um, but yeah. So but anyway, I've I've stayed in Hastings um, the whole time I've been living in um, England. So I I now. Um, I was part of the original cohort of Filipino nurses who worked at the Congress Hospital. There were 24 of us, and um, happy to say that 18 of us stayed in the UK. Um, my wife was also uh, part of the original group, the pioneers. When I arrived in Hastings, there were only two other Filipino nurses who was working at the hospital. Um, so we were like Hastings pioneers. They didn't, didn't know what to do with us, really. Um, and I guess um, thinking about the journey of how Filipinos um, are being looked after now, or and for uh, all the um, for that matter, all IENs has changed in the last two to three years. We were talking about earlier before we started, and although it's really good that so much has changed in the last three to four years. Um, it's also really sad that, you know, it will take the pandemic before we shine a light on internationally educated nurses. And we have listened to our um, um, speakers earlier, uh, how much um, the NHS relies on um, internationally educated nurses. I remember our faces on the front page of Hastings Observer um the week that we arrived and it says filipino nurses arrived in hastings to help with the crisis and i guess um so much has changed now we're i think we're number two we're um there's already 50 54,750 filipino nurses who are registered in the nmc um, so we're not just working within the NHS, but there are also a lot of um, Filipino nurses who are working in social care and the community in care homes and nursing homes. And obviously, on top of those, the Filipinos um, families, the Filipino nurses families who also work in, in healthcare as nursing auxiliaries or support workers and um, re uh, 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 radiologists there's a lot of filipinos arriving now um in the last three years i branched out and started working in um primary care and introduced mental health services in gp surgeries we know how much the pandemic changed the way we live and changed our world basically um and when I started uh, offering mental health services in primary care, that was also the same week that the prime minister announced the lockdown. And I thought, Oof, what have I done? <laughs> but I haven't rested since. I haven't stopped since. Um, the ethos, the mission, and the vision has always been to provide the care where it's needed and to bridge the gap um, between the provision of mental health services in primary care and specialist services. Um, we often hear it, we all always hear it on the news in all documentaries about you know, people waiting to be assessed for Asperger's, autism, wait, pa patients waiting in A&E for four to six hours or sometimes even longer before they can be assessed or patients being carted off, mental health patients being carted off in detention cells, which isn't the place for them really. So if you are having 
a crisis if you're feeling low and depressed i think the last place that you would want to be at would be sitting in an emergency room with crying babies with people who are physically unwell um and we have managed to achieve that i started the journey in hastings worked there for two hours and in the first couple of years uh proved that you know i'm not just there to start prescribing antidepressants to everyone or start prescribing benzodiazepines or diazepam to everyone as a matter of fact with the statistics that i've done with with um a study that i did um on two occasions for the first and the second year we had the massive reduction of 20 to 30 percent of antidepressant and uh, benzodiazepine prescription during those time and also uh 20 to 30 percent reduction of people needing to be admitted into hospital and people needing to go into a &E and people needing to call 999 and other urgent care services so it was a success so august last year i decided to branch out and leave hastings as a work i still live in hastings and um started um offering the same service in eastbourne and it's been really really successful as well i've been really lucky with my um bosses at victoria medical center because we share the same vision um in december so th three months after i started working within that surgery fifty thousand patients registered uh, we decided to open a uh, room 201 which is basically a lounge in the town center we rented the room where people with mental health difficulties can just pop in have a chat with me or some of my social prescribers and for them to be signposted and have tea or coffee so no beds no white walls just pink sofa actually not chosen by me but chosen by my boss a pink sofa and an orange sofa and sat there just talking about anything that they want to talk about um yes so that's my journey really thanks Thank